Hello, hope you're having a great day today. Welcome. I wanted to talk to you today about a, a novel that used to be my favorite. Um, it's not anymore after I read it a second time, but it's still a very compelling novel, very compelling read, and it's sweeping in its arcness. Um, and it was written in the late 70s. Uh, the novel's called Lucifer's Hammer. Um, it's published by uh, the, the super science fiction tag team of Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. Uh, they wrote a number of books together. Um, I've got a lot of them. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed them. They're, they're very much into the hard science fiction side of things. They've got to make sure everything that they have you know, makes sense. And some of their things were published a while ago in the 70s, some of them in the 80s through the 90s and such. Um, and both of the writers will write things in other places um, and time, uh, but I've got a number of books by them. And we're definitely going to be taking a look at some of these other ones later on, not all of them. A Moat in God's Eye will definitely be in my uh, next, uh, in, in my first 50 uh, that I've already planned ahead of time. When I created this video series, I don't want you to be bored um, and stop at like five or six videos in. I wanted to make sure it had legs, and it does. Um, I planned, uh, already outlined the first 50 videos. So, what we're going to be doing today, though, is taking a look at Lucifer's First Hammer. It's a novel written in the late 70s, in 77, and, and actually was nominated for the Hugo Award for Best Science Fiction Story uh, the next year. Um, so it was well received, um, and it is very good. And this is the first novel that I had ever read that replaced my first favorite novel, which was Dracula. Uh, growing up after I read Dracula, I said this is the best novel I've ever read. And that was true for years and years and years. Um, I encountered this book, I actually purchased it when I was in Morgantown. And as you can see, my copy is like super beat up. This is just, just beat up copy of this book. That's okay. Um, but I purchased this copy at a bookstore in Morgantown, West Virginia. While that was there as an undergrad, I didn't read it till last year, my first year of grad school. I absolutely fell in love with it. I thought it was this amazing book. Um, the book has this sweeping cast of characters. Um, it has this giant cast. A lot of stuff is happening in the book. Um, and it goes from uh, the initial discovery of a comet that's going to be coming near Earth, ultimately to uh, Hammerfall, to post-Hammerfall world, and takes you all the way to the end of the story. It has one complete set of stories. It would not you know, it, like like a lot of books um, that are allowed to be like really book length, it can have the entire plot line of the book in it. You don't have to break it up into plots. But you can never publish it as like a single story uh, movie. There's just so much stuff here. Um, the movie that probably best represents its deep impact, which has this sweeping cast of characters and also has something hitting Earth too, although it's not, the, the ending's very different um, and such. So anyway, in this storyline, we're going to be following several main characters. Um, of course, multiple places. At, at the first start, we're going to have um, follow this sort of a son of a wealthy family who owns a business, and they he is also a junior astronomer. He's going to be one of the ones that discovers a comet. Um, the comet is believed by scientists to be coming very, very close to Earth. Um, Senator Arthur Angelicus of California is going to push for and lobby for um, a science expedition to be sent out to it because it's because of how close it's going to be coming to the earth and this is going to be a rare opportunity to kind of study a comet in its natural environment so they he puts together um a team uh and lobbies for a team to go and actually research the comet as it gets closer to earth how we're following a number of people like the scientists at the jet propulsion laboratories jpl um, and such uh, as they start to study this comet. Uh, of course, they don't believe that the comet is going to actually impact the Earth. It's just going to come really close um, and such. Uh, but And uh, it's named, um, it's nicknamed after the, the, the person who discovers it is Tim Hamner. Uh, they, and so they start referring to it as the, the hammer uh, by, the, by the press and such because it's faster to say than Hamner's comet. <laughs> so they refer to it as the hammer. Um, or Hamner's Hammer, if you prefer. Um, and so um, the comet's getting closer and closer to the Earth as it does. Um, it starts to dominate the sky and so forth. And a lot of people who aren't scientists um, are going to just start preparing just in case it does hit the Earth. They're going to grab a bunch of water, grab some food, and so forth. So you know, ju just in case. Um, so there is some sort of prep work that goes by, by local people prior uh, to the comet arriving. Because the comet is so close to Earth, it's not going to smash into Earth itself. Obviously, that would be a very different book um, if an entire comet were to smash into Earth. But enough of its material and particulate hits the Earth and some of its nuclear core um, that it causes massive amounts of devastation. Um, oceans are vaporizing as lots of as, as impacts are hitting. Tidal waves are huge, are hitting places um, and such. And the, the world undergoes hammerfall. 
and it's going to change significantly after Hammerfall. Um, basically, after Hammerfall, it's going to become your now. Now the work is going to be a post-apocalyptic work, and now they're going to talk about how they're going to struggle to survive, how they are going to uh, figure this out. There's going to be a variety of tribes that are going to sort of associate themselves. The Senator Jellicoe is going to have a base that he refers to as the Stronghold in the Sierra Mountains. Of California, it's kind of his home ranch, and the local people that are there. It's easy and very secure because of its location up in the mountains, um, and they will let in. They're not going to let in a bunch of extra people because they know that everybody's going to want to come in and, and eat their food and provide their things and so forth, but won't be able, you know, to actually contribute to the community. They want to be able to make sure the people that are there are contributing and active members of their society. Um, there's a love triangle between one of our heroes. Um, and Arthur Jellicoe's uh, daughter, um, and this astronaut who was sent on the mission, who has just come back with all the information, um, the astronaut and the daughter are together, um, and so forth. And basically the idea is, is that whoever ends up kind of marrying and courting the daughter successfully is basically going to be the one who takes over uh, the stronghold after the senator dies. Which is going to because he's old and you know without all the medical um, stuff available to him, he's clearly going to not be long for this world. Um, and you have um, various bandits that are going to attack the stronghold, and you got to deal with a number of those sorts of folks out, out there. Um, and you're having a number of struggles that are happening inside the camp as well. Ultimately, you're going to find out uh, what's going to happen, who's going to win, who's going to end up securing the girl, and so forth. And so... Um, it's 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 again it's this huge cast of characters. You're following everybody from this scientist at HPL, um, who saves all these great works of mankind rather than saving himself. Um, he actually does everything he can to secure that knowledge uh, will survive. All the great pieces of art, all the great works, he will actually save all these books. Um, and so there is very 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 detailed and intricate stories that are happening with this huge cast of characters. Everybody from astronomers and scientists to politicians to to bandits and more. Everybody you're following and everybody's going to have these major parts after Hammerfall. So and before Hammerfall they may have these different sort of uh, inter um, separate sort of uh, storylines that are happening um, and maybe interacting occasionally but then after Hammerfall they're definitely going to tie these characters all together and such um, in a major way. Um, so Hammerfall is this sort of definitive moment of the story um, and such. And so. Um, the book is called Lucifer's Hammer. It's named after uh, the fact that it was not uh, this this hammer, this comet that was just going to pass by peacefully. Um, it actually took out large parts of the Earth. Um, there's going to be a lot of things that are going to happen. Nuclear weapons are going to get dropped um, and such. And so the world is going to be much of much more of a, a traditional sort of post-apocalyptic story about halfway through. Um, and they do a good job with it. So there's basically three acts to the story, the pre-Hammerfall uh, story as they build it up. What's the, what's the comet? What's happening? Who are these people? And such. Then Hammerfall itself and how people are surviving and getting away from the water. Um, the, the, and then the third and final act is um, the storyline after Hammerfall, the setup of the stronghold and all the other things, and all the major characters that are going to kind of come together. So it's a great story. Um, I love it. It's, 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 it's got a sweeping epic arc to it. And again, this was the first novel <laughs> that replaced Dracula as my, my favorite novel, my top. And, and, um, and then I went back and reread it like four years ago. And I was like, this is not my favorite novel <laughs> anymore. Um, on a second reading, it wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. And I think that's because I was a different reader. Uh, you know, uh, a few years ago. By that time, I left grad school. I really encountered a lot of these great writers, these great writing styles. Uh, I could recognize tropes, and when I when I went through, it's still good writing. The writing of a Pornell and Niven story is always going to be good. It's always going to have a lot of great ideas, and it does. Um, it still held the test of time, and I still enjoyed reading it a second time. But at the same token, it also wasn't it, it wasn't as great on the second reading because I had probably evolved as a reader. Um, as uh, you know, I, I now have you know I now prefer things that are kind of a little bit less outside of the genres, the tropes and such. You know, I had already read Earth Abides, um, a post-apocalyptic work, which I think is much better um, <laughs> because of how different it is and the different questions it asks uh, and such. Um, and you can take I'll put down to you a link of my review of Earth Abides. It's one of my favorite. Uh, novels right now and so it's one of the first ones I led with so I have a link to it in the comments below you can go check it out it's a very different view of kind of post-apocalyptic works whereas Lucifer's Hammer like many books that came before it was sort of a as soon as the law and the sort of aspects of our society collapses people are going to turn to chaos and then slowly rebuild which is exactly what happens in this book um, 
um, and that was kind of the sort of understanding, it's going to be the opposite. People are going to sort of cling to the sort of bastions and strongholds of society and only slowly over time are they going to sort of peel off and to turn towards um, a more and more chaotic sort of situation. And so it's very different. Um, and so I like that a lot. It's, you know, he wrote what the story he wanted to write, and it's very compelling. Um, so there are some things here that are going to be sort of, sort of more common trope pushing and such, but it's going to be in, in a good way. It's going to be um, a, a valuable story. It's not, you're not going to waste your time reading it. It's not one of my top 10 novels anymore. It's probably my top, my next 10, um, or maybe my next 10 after that. I still really enjoyed the novel on a second read, but it wasn't as good on a second read through as it was on the first read through again. But that might've been because I had changed as a writer from grad school to four years ago when I'm in my late thirties and I've read all these great works by all these great writers. And I've been very passionate about pursuing the classics. And I said, hey, why don't I go back and read this book? It was such a great book. I had done that with Dracula probably four or five times. And every single time I read Dracula again, I came away saying, this is my favorite. This is such a great story. But this is not a book I'd recommend reading a second time. You will not you won't need to. Um, it's a long book. It's an epic scope um, and so forth. It's going to take you days to read it. Um, it's going to be like one of those George R. R. Martin novels or, you know, a George novel in terms of how long it's going to take you to read. Um, even though this book might look like it's a small printing, it's not. This is 650 pages. Um, that is a big, thick tome of a book. But the good thing is you invest in that price, you're going to have this book for like a week reading it. Um, but it's worth it. It's, it's, it's definitely a classic. Like I said, it was nominated for a Hugo Award for Best Science Fiction Novel that year. Um, so it was highly lauded. Um, there's not really a bad place. I can just recognize the tropes now. The, the hot daughter um, has to be captured and courted in order to secure. So, you know, I can recognize these tropes now um, a little bit more. <laughs> familiar with them and such after having read about some of these other things that are no longer, that aren't, aren't as heavily into this sort of tropes and genres. I mean, this is being written after the genrefication of post-apocalyptic literature, and so it's going to be following that sort of trajectory. Um, you can't break out of it. It's hard to do so, so it doesn't. And it's fine. It's perfectly good. It goes through three separate acts, which if you were to novelize it or, or, or to movieitize it, you'd probably have three separate movies out of it. Pre-fall, fall, and then post-fall. So you can... Um, and each of those is very, very sweeping. And there's some great, there's some great sort of cinematic moments. Um, there's one scene um, on train tracks with this car um, during Hammerfall that I think is particularly, particularly evocative. Uh, I think it's a heavily cinematic scene um, and such. I don't want to talk about it because I don't want there to be spoilers. But even the second time going back and reading that novel, I was like, that is just a great scene. So there are all these really interesting things that they build into it. Lots of suspense uh, and such. So I'm not going to ruin it with a lot of spoilers for what happens or where they wind up. But it's a great story. Um, and you're going to be investing a lot, of, a lot of time into it. And you're going to really enjoy it. Um, and again, this was my favorite novel for about 10 years. So, Lucifer's Hammer. It's good stuff. Uh, I'm going to link to you uh, in the, below a copy, just if you're interested in picking it up on Amazon or something like that, so that you can pick it up pretty quickly. You don't have to spend a lot of time with it. Um, I uh, Hey, if you took some time out of your day to watch this video, spend some time with it, and invest in both the video and myself, I really appreciate it. We all have busy things to do busy lives and such. So thanks again for just spending some time with me. I appreciate that. Um, if you did like this, feel free to hit that subscribe button over there. There's going to be so much content to follow. I have tons and tons of stuff that's going to be coming down the pikes. Um, I did this as part of a two-part of a sort of a Lucifer series today. That's why I'm wearing the same clothing <laughs> and such. It's a Sunday morning. I'll be posting them probably back-to-back -back days for you. So you can kind of see my first part was uh, The Warhound and the World's Pain by Marco Moorcock, which I just finished recording. Um, and then now this is going to be this. I'm going to put them up probably back to back. Lucifer's Hammer. Both The, uh, the first book actually has Lucifer as one of its main characters. Um, and it's kind of a Dante-esque sort of thing. This one is a science fiction that just has Lucifer really in its name. But I still thought it would be fun to have them back to back. Um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. If you've read it, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it. Did you agree? Disagree? Um, is it one of your favorite novels or not? Why? Uh, do you, what do you think of Niven and Purnell? Um, I'm sure if you're familiar with Niven and Purnell, you'll know why we're going to be doing The Moat in God's Eye at some point in time, because it's such a great story. Um, I also think um, if you're interested in reading, if you've heard of this book um, and so forth, if you like Deep Impact, this is very Deep Impact-ish. Um, I would say that the story that probably best represents what Lucifer's Hammer is trying to do is Deep Impact with this sweeping arc, all these different character stories, um, and you're going to have all these definitive stories both before and after. Um, although Deep Impact doesn't have a, a post sort of apocalyptic event, it's just kind of fast forwards to the, the hit of the... Um, 
of the half, the first half of the, of the sort of comment, and then the second, and then you're going to go ahead. Whereas this one will have that second chapter of what happened after, immediately after the impact, and then all the way to the end. Um, whereas that one kind of fast forwarded it. So. D.A. Pan back with them would be probably like the first third of this book. <laughs> but that's kind of the sweeping arc that that would be aiming for, this giant mythic arc while these characters and such. So if you're familiar with Deep Impact and you like it, you'll understand where Lucifer's Hammer is coming from. I'd recommend it. Check it out. You're going to really enjoy it. Um, let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm always happy to talk about it with whether you agreed or disagreed. I try to keep my reviews spoiler free um, as a general rule. I won't spoiler things that aren't in the first couple of chapters. So if you want to talk about any of the spoilers um, in, in, in this comments below, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that uh, with characters, concepts, the stronghold, some of the fights, um, some of the characters and such. I'm more than happy to engage with that on you. Feel free to talk about it in the comments below. Once again, thank you so much for your time.